Welcome back, listeners to Learning from Friends. My name is Cade Curtis, your tour guide on this lovely adventure that we get to spend together from time to time with each other. Typically, every two weeks, sometimes we throw a back-to-back one, depending on what it's coming up on. And as those listeners that have stuck around and come in and out or popped into an episode here and there, thank you. I appreciate you so very much. And before we get started, we got my mom's quote of the day. So mom, take it away. Thank you, mom. I appreciate you for always doing what you do. Now, this episode today, I love when I'm able to sit back and learn from different varieties of things from people and get the opportunity to sit down and speak with people that I grew up with and spent time with, whether it be from elementary school, middle school, high school, college, uh, coworkers. This individual goes back to middle school and high school together. And so I was super stoked back in, I believe it was 2016, she came out and she wrote a book. She came out with this amazing autobiography that she wrote called Miracles and Freak Accidents. And it's so cool that whenever she told me she was coming out with it, I remember buying a copy from Amazon, sitting with it and reading it in two weeks. And for me, it takes me a while to read a book. I'm just a slow reader. and But reading a book in two weeks for me is, is pretty quick. So it's Quite a great read. Anybody that has the opportunity to sit down and read it, I recommend going on to Amazon. I'll have a link for it at the very bottom uh, of the episode so you can be able to purchase a copy. So to start us into this lovely autobiographic episode of writing a book about herself here, Kristen, welcome to the podcast. Ah, oh, thank you. That's so sweet. I appreciate that. Hey, I, I give all the best compliments when it comes to it because of it's true. And I even pulled it back out the other day from going back through. And I remember I was supposed to get you to sign my copy and never got you to sign it. (laughs) Oh, well, we don't live too far away from each other now. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. So going back to middle school, high school, how are we connected? We were in marching band together. Did you did flag line or was it dance team? I was on flags. I think we combined it uh, like my junior year. It was like flag and dance, but ultimately I did flags. And then I played alto sax uh, our senior year in concert band. I don't know if you remember that or not. I remember it briefly. Yeah, Yeah, you were like first chair and I was the last chair. So I think I like waved at you on the stage or something. (laughs) No, we probably had battles for last year because I always fought to go to the back. Tim was first chair. I would always try to do last. (laughs) Yeah, good old Tim Griffith. Hope he's doing well. I need to check in with him. See how he's doing. So the the large majority of the audience has no clue who you are going to this episode. There's going to be a a handful that may kind of be able to know you from our lovely past that we have. But give me like a short little Wikipedia page of who is Kristen. Oh, that's such a hard question. I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm sort of a jack of all trades. You know, I I have a lot of interests. I've done a lot of things career wise since we've been in school and just kind of always really loved helping people. That was like the the core goal that I've always done is that something to help people no matter what it was. And I've enjoyed everything that I've done so far. And, you know, hopefully I have way more to go and, you know, I'll keep making a difference in people's lives and, you know, just keep I don't know, just being awesome. <laughs> I love it. That's a w- amazing response there. C- how much you kind of care for people is a very important factor. You you get back out of the world what you put into it. So good vibes all around. Yeah, I mean, I know that in the past, you know, I've been quite awful to people, but I've sought to make those things right um, over time. And um, sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And there's grace for when it didn't, and there's you know praise for when it did. So that's a win. There's always time in life to change the dialogue that's there. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're coming to terms with in making decisions and trying to find the nice positives into the world. Of I know I have a lot of skeletons in my closet that I'm still constantly dealing with and trying to come to terms with. So good for you. Love it. Now, going into writing a book, there are so many misconceptions about being an author 
especially when it comes about writing an autobiography or a personal narrative about themselves. Do you have any that you'd like to address? I guess the the biggest misconception is that it would be easy. It definitely was not easy. Um, It's hard to, you know, knowing that I wanted to share my story and that I had a story to tell and, you know, kind of going through that was like a, a mini therapy session for me in a lot of ways. And I had to take like a good, honest look at like what I truly believed in. And it took me a while to get it together because, you know, I, I asked so many people that were close to me at the time, you know, like if I could use them in the book and, you know, what they thought about this paragraph or that paragraph. And, you know, can you edit my manuscript? And, you know, can I ask you for questions about what are your favorite miraculous events in your life and then I use them in the book and it's just um yeah it was uh <laughs> it definitely wasn't easy but it was definitely like a divinely inspired book for sure and that's phenomenal to think about the you mentioned the word kind of therapeutic there for it and I I love that process that you're kind of uh, using that word it's a very great way to kind of look at yourself from an outside perspective, looking in, in a way, when you're writing something. Because when the words go to a page, it has this whole interesting translation that comes up. So what is your background really in writing? Is that like a skill that you've always kind of had? Did you develop it over the years? Did you do like some workshops, classes, talks? Like how did you get to to have your writing skill? Because if your book was so easy to sit back and read, and I love that the way you you wrote. So can you kind of tell me about your developmental of your style? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I've always really loved writing. I mean, even as a child, I would just kind of hold myself up in my aunt's room over the summer or my room wherever I was. And I would just kind of write stuff and read books that she had. And I was just like reading romance novels that she had in her room as like a young child, just trying to see like what, you know, how to write and how books went and stuff. And I actually, in the fourth grade, won the young author spare from my school for a story that I wrote. And um, it was just a complete fictional thing. And it was just, I made it up the top of my head and it was about the go- uh, a boy with the golden flute. Like he basically steals the golden flute that belonged to like this man. And, you know, he was a bad kid. Then this man tutored him and they became friends and he taught him the meaning of life. Then the old man died and he, he like w- made the world a better place by, you know, knowing the old man or whatever. And yeah, I won the young author's fair. <laughs> That's impressive. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, more academically. So, you know, I always kind of wrote in high school as we had to. And then um, in college, uh, when I was getting my second degree in political science, I had to write a lot. So literally, I would just stack up my classes and write a paper during one class, save it, and then go to the next class, write the next paper, turn that other paper in, (laughs) you know. Wow. (laughs) Kind of do it that way. Yeah. In the, yeah, getting to harness your skills. I mean, literally, that takes a lot of effort to do so. And did you have any teachers, maybe perhaps, that kind of gave you some good push forward? I remember Miss Eller in high school that really pushed me, and then Miss Clayton that really pushed me forward on being a, a, a good poetry writer. Yeah, yeah, I really, I like Miss Eller. I actually went by the school in 2017, because it was like 10 years after I had, we had graduated. And I walked into her class when school was done. And she and Coach Jones were in there. And I went, what up? It's been 10 years. (laughs) That's exactly (laughs) what I said. I just walked up in there and was like, what up? It's been 10 years. (laughs) And um yeah, she seemed to be doing well. And I just, you know, was like, hey, I'm so grateful, you know, for like, all you taught me. And I just, I remember like she would write me notes to get out of the wrath of Mrs. Mullins for being late for roll call at band Mm -hmm. practice. Cause I would be sitting on one of the comfy chairs. She was my last period of the day. So I'd be sitting in like her comfy chairs reading the Hobbit for my research paper. And yeah, I would be like, like, it's almost four o'clock. I gotta go. Please give me a note. So I don't have to run laps. (laughs) Man, I always remember moving my having to move my car to make it before roll call and trying to haul it just to get from one place to the other. And 
I love Miss Mullins for being that diligence there, but at the same time, it was just kind of like, oh my words, give us a little bit of grace, but I totally understand it that we need to have rules to follow because if, if you bend one, you're going to bend another one and it just comes a cycle that, so having that strictness was really good. Speaking of Miss Mullins, if you get the chance, anybody go back and listen to Pam Mullins episode. It's a two-parter. One of my favorite teachers of all time. I love getting to talk with her on the podcast earlier. Those that just now coming to the podcast and know Miss Mullins or had her, go back and listen to that. Great episode. Great episode. Sorry for that little plug there, Kristen. Couldn't help it whenever we said Miss Mullins. Had had to jump back there. <laughs> no, I was just thinking about that. I was just thinking. I was like, yeah, I didn't do a podcast episode with her. But yeah, for those of you who don't know and you're kind of wondering, like, what's the big deal about being late to band practice? Or like, do you really have to run? It's like, yes, you really have to run. You really did push-ups. And um, we really did wake up at four in the morning at band camp to do an all-day thing until like midnight every night for like three weeks. And marching band is basically the military for high schoolers if you're not in ROTC. <laughs> it is rough, but I, I feel like I learned so much from it. And I think that was also what made a good connection with so many people because you, you, you got to have a group of people. And being there with the drama department as well, making the connection with drama as well. The arts department really kind of just had a good connection with everyone. So that was that was a blast to have that. Yeah, absolutely. Tell us about the audience, about your book. Give us a little bit. I kind of threw a little bit of stuff out there. Tell me about kind of like a little synopsis here of the book. So or like a little preview for those that want to be able to read it. So when I wrote the book, I actually, it was crazy. I actually, um, the idea kind of fleetingly came to me my senior semester of undergrad at Georgia State. And I was like, I should write a book. And I'm like, wait a minute, I got to graduate first. I'm taking like six or seven classes. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, you know, I went through college later. Like I graduated undergrad in 2016 because I, I paid for my college education. I worked for like a long time. I got two degrees because I didn't know which one I liked best and I didn't know what I wanted to do, but eh, you know, say lovey. And so I just remember I was laying in bed one night and it was like three 30 or four in the morning. I, I, w- I wake up a lot and I'm a hot sleeper. So I woke up and I'm like burning up as normal. And I just sit straight up in the bed. Like I just shoot straight up in the bed and I look around and I say out loud, I need to lead a Ted talk. <laughs> and I was like, but how, how do I lead a Ted talk? And I was like, oh, my book, I'm going to graduate in like a couple of weeks. And so I, yeah, I made it a, a goal. And then when I graduated, I spent 40 hours a week for six weeks, the first six weeks that I was a college graduate writing a book. So I wrote and published it in six weeks. Wow. Holy moly. I didn't realize it was that's, that's impressive. <laughs> I didn't realize it was that quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I self published it. And I used to be really kind of ashamed about that. Because, you know, as an amateur, I published it, I didn't really know what I was doing. And the formatting came out really wonky. But the older I get, and the more books I thumb through, I'm like, you know, who cares if it's not perfect? And who cares if, you know, I self published it, at least, you know, I, I followed through with what, you know, my conscience was telling me to do or, you know, and and so I felt like I was being true to myself at that point. And I may write another book. I may not write another book. Who knows? But I think it's something to be proud of. It is. I 110% agree with that. Same when I did this podcast here, as I've gone through over the 50th episode or the 20 in the 25th episode and kind of going on, people have asked, why don't you like actually sit back and get sponsorships? Why don't you choose to make money off of it? Or why do you choose to do this way? I go, "It's, it's my project. I just want to get it out there. I want to, it, my creativity, something that I can remember and look back on myself later and go, hey, you know what? I did it. I did it my way. I didn't have to worry about all the different ways that someone else wanted to do it. And you did that. That, and that I applaud you to be able to come up and, and do that with yourself. Cause that's, oh, hats off. Again, I, I'm going to say that a lot. Hats off. Now, the title Miracles and Freak Accidents. How did you come up with that? Every, a lot of things go back to like my senior year of college because that was just a pivotal year and a half, two years for me. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. It took a long time for me to get through college. Hey, there's no issues with that. If I would have not done it 
straight out of high school and pushed through doing every single semester, I don't think I ever would have done college. I don't think I, if I just wouldn't have powered through and just did it straight, 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 I would have never done it. So everyone has their own different pacing for it. And you know what? You got it done. That's what matters. That's true. Yeah. I mean, once you once you hit an adulthood, like in your 20s and well, I mean, mid 20s, because young 20s are still babies. But, you know, once you once you hit that adult kind of maturity level, it doesn't really matter what you're doing with your life, you know, as long as you're maintaining and, and contributing to society and keeping yourself afloat, you know, that's pretty much the only thing that matters. And so I've never understood other people who look down on others for whatever they're doing. I just think it's the stupidest thing in the world. But anyway, to answer your question, the title Miracles and Freak Accidents, um, senior year of college at Georgia State, it was just kind of something I said, like tongue in cheek about my life all the time. And I think it's kind of, um, you know, I, I said it to myself one day, I probably walk into class or something. I was alone, whatever I was doing. And I, I said, you know, like, dang, it's either one or the other, a miracle or a freak accident, always in my life, like just one or the other, you know, like things always work out, either it's accidental or it's miraculous. And then I just kind of stopped and like the whole world came to a stop. And I was like, oh. That is an amazing revelation, you know? And so uh, I just knew right then and there that that was my thing. That was, I didn't, I don't think I knew that I was going to write a book about it, but um, I knew that, that that was what my life's purpose was about, you know, seeing the miraculous and accidental happen um, because my whole life has been either one or the other. And, you know, basically telling people, no matter what your circumstances are, you're going to do incredible things, you know, and this is not the end, you know, it never is. And so that's kind of what my whole life purpose I think is. And I hope I haven't fulfilled it yet. <laughs> I hope I still have a long way to go. <laughs> you still do. There's definitely a, a long way still to go, but the words of encouragement that you establish now continue onward. You can always have something to look back on to, to be able to remind you of, where you were to where you are now and it's just that's a really cool like in college the epiphany out of nowhere of i need to a write a book and b here's my title that's going to come up from like those split moments that pop up i love it <laughs> now how what's that driving force behind being so vulnerable and telling a personal story in a book format because that takes a lot in a person to really allow an audience, especially most that you have no clue of, connect with you. Like that, that takes a lot. Um, so I guess, you know, it just kind of, I've always been a speaker, like a, a writer. I've always loved having an audience to talk to. And, you know, even in youth group, I just, I kind of was made fun of a lot in youth group for being a drama queen or the center of attention. And, and that's honestly pretty traumatizing for me. That's something that I really had to work through, like growing up and growing out of high school and as an adult, you know, you know being, oh, my gosh, I'm a drama queen or am, am I the center of attention? And then just kind of becoming an adult and being like, who cares? Like, if, if that's your personality, that's your personality. Like, you know, there's leverage for that. There's a reason I'm that way. And there's a reason why I'm so animated and I love to tell stories and I love to talk and I love to be the center of attention, even just for like a split second. So I leveraged it and I knew that I had an amazing story to tell. I've told it before, like sporadically throughout my life in like FCA and in church and stuff like that and small groups and stuff. And I knew that I wanted to be a guest speaker. Like I said, I woke up with the idea of a TED talk. So it was just kind of... um. I knew it's what had to be done. And I knew that, you know, good was going to come from it. So that's why I did it. Speaks volumes of the confidence and trust in yourself as well to be able to show that for others. Because as you said, being the miracle in the freak accidents title here is you are telling other people it's okay too. Like that, that's really cool. You know? Fail to do that. Now you said six weeks, I think you said 40 hours a week sitting down and working on this thing. Did you set a deadline or did you just go and this is what was kind of the results of six weeks? 
Yeah, so I had just graduated undergrad. I had gone through a whirlwind of just like emotions of just, I just finished college. I paid for it myself. You know, I'm the second one out of my entire family, which is my me and my brother, the only ones in our entire family, extended and immediate, who graduated high school and then went on to graduate college. Like it was a miracle if you graduated high school. Um, in my family. And then the the even more miraculous was that we went to college. And so, yes, it took me longer. Yes, I made a different route. You know, yes, I did so many different things, but damn it, I did it, you know? And so I was just in such a whirlwind of emotion when I, when I finished school that I was like, oh my gosh, like I have to like ride this high and do what the next right thing is. And that's to write my book. So I just, I jumped off the cliff I put out my proverbial parasail, I guess, and just kind of took off. And, you know, I stopped by the school a few times uh, after I graduated and I just sat in one of my professor's classes and was like, I'm at a standstill. I've written all I can write about. And, you know, what do I do now? And, And she said, well, why don't you incorporate other people's stories? And I was like, I was just thinking that. And she was like, yeah, you should. So I did. And that's like the second part of my book. Um, it kind of segues like the whole first part was like all I could do. It was just like I word vomited everything about what I knew I had to talk about. And then it was like, and now let's hear from other people. <laughs> <laughs> you had the you wrote, then you had the other people collect their stories in here. Who was all involved in this process? Because again, it it took a team to kind of get there. Who was all involved from like helping proofread stories are kind of involved here, editors, people to bounce ideas off of. It was all involved. Okay. Yeah. So I mentioned a lot of people in my acknowledgements and some wanted to be anonymous at the time, um, you know, and, and I don't, I don't know that that it's a big deal now, but you know, a lot of people that influenced me were my professors in college. And that's kind of, you know, who I kind of had in my heart the most. I think is is one professor in particular. I just had such affection for him. Anyway, so I that was a big driving force of of my book. And then also I had um I think my pastor mentors at the time, uh Chris and Jessica Mormon, who planted a church from Atlanta called Grace Midtown up in DC, called Grace Capital City. And I know that we follow each other online for a while. You've probably seen me up there a few times. And then when I lived up there for a while. And so um, I mentioned them in my book, um, my best, one of my best friends that I've had for over a decade that I actually met outside of high school, but was the same age as us. Her name's Arielle. And she actually proofread my book and edited it for me. She has like a master's in, I think, creative writing. And so I really trust that she's always proofread my stuff, even when we were in college. And she would be at like Statesboro and I'd email her and be like, can you proofread this? You know, and so she's a huge part of my story, um, always will be. And the second part of my book with like all the other people They were just close friends that I had around me at the time. And I literally just walked around and asked like, hey, would you mind helping me out with this project? And if so, like, what do you want to talk about? And I would sit there and record them or I would sit there and type everything down or I'd hand them my phone and be like, will you type this out for me? Or I'm like, or can you send me an email in a word format and have this whole story? And sometimes I copied and pasted the story exactly. Sometimes I edited it and like switched it around and then sent it back to them and asking them if they liked it. And then I had a lot of my professors at school put their input into like, I'd be like, how do I make this more academic or how do I dumb this down? Or, you know, so it was a really, it was a whole process, but I, you know, it was worth it. Always. It's always worth it just to, as you said, jump off the cliff, the parachute, parasail, yeah. go for it. Now, how did your family and friends kind of react when you go, I'm going to, I need to write this book. I'm going to write this book. And whenever you, you go through your story, and you're referencing people, so again, some wanting to remain anonymous, some not wanting to, you know, wanting, I mean, some people wanting to use their names. How did you find that kind of making people kind of react? Were some people kind of uncomfortable with it? Were some people kind of frustrated with it? Was there a lot of joy that kind of came from it as well? What were kind of the emotions that kind of came from that? 
because you were pretty vulnerable at some points in the stories. No kidding. Um, so my mom and I have a much better relationship these days than we did back then. I'll just preface that right quick. Cause I know that she'll probably want to listen to this episode. So I love you, mom. You're the best. Uh, okay. Now back to my story. Um, <laughs> Shout out to mom. When I first told When I first told my mom that I was writing a book, I don't know that she really understood what that meant because I had always been writing, you know, growing up just kind of here. I want to read you my poem, mom, or here, like take my notebook. I've been writing poems in for the last three years and read them all. Like I've always been like desperate for attention and desperate for approval. And, you know, please tell me that I'm smart and that I'm good and kind and et cetera, et cetera, you know. And so uh, when I told her, I think she was just like, what does that mean? You know, you've always kind of written stuff. And we, she was working a lot. You know, she was dealing with working 60 hours a week and she was trying to retire early. And she ended up retiring, right, either before or after I graduated undergrad. So just kind of in that same time frame of just kind of everything happening at once. And um, my Mima, her mama just died the year before. So the mm. whole lot to deal with. And so I don't really know that she grasped it. And then when I finally wrote it and I ordered it from Amazon and I handed, she was the first person I handed it to. And I was like, read this. Oh, yay. She basically like, she, she read it and then she skipped through a lot of it. And we just kind of picked and picked things out and stuff. And she would kind of like criticize some of the stuff that I wrote. And I was afraid a lot of what she would think. And surprisingly, it was my stepdad who actually sat down with the book at the the lamp living room for two straight hours and read the entire thing. And he was actually the person who was most invested in what I did and just was like astounded by it. And I looking back on that my stepdad and I haven't always had the best relationship but you know now that I'm older now that you know everything's better now it just that that means so much to me to like see him sit under that light you know for two hours and just read my book because I don't know it was just no greater feeling than you know having something tangible that I had made happen and then watching people enjoy it's just the best thing in the world it truly is I remember in my senior year in high school or is it freshman year in college? I can't remember specifically which one it was. I, I had just, I've been writing poetry since sixth grade and I've decided I was going to put a manuscript together of, I think it was like over 150, 200 poems. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to make this at Staples Copy and Print Center. And I'm going to just make my own copies. I'm going to start giving them to people that, uh, you know, for like Christmas presents and stuff. I remember my grandfather Papa getting a hold of it and sitting down and reading it. And I remember coming back over him asking questions and we never had the best of relationships at all, but him, as you said, someone sitting and reading it and then that, that investment and then asking you questions and talking to you about it is, oh my gosh, it's mind blowing. It, it's, it's just like a huge gift that someone's kind of connecting in with you at a different level that maybe you never had before. So that's really cool to get to kind of have that that little connection there with people. So I'm glad you got that. That's so cool. That is so cool. Now for your emotions, you mentioned a lot of like kind of the emotion kind of going in with it. How did it feel once you had turned the book into self-published, you had hit it, send it off the printer and say, I'm done. How did that feel like that kind of getting it off your chest and knowing that you had finished this? Uh you're taking me back to some really emotionally heightened times. I feel like all the flutteries coming back when I'm talking about this, but I don't, I just remember feeling this. I don't know. I think I was sitting on my bed and I had just hit like click or whatever, you know, I just had finished it and I was just like, man, that was awesome. You know, I'm kind of sad that it's over, but you know, I'm, I'm so excited for, you know, I'm so excited to get the book in my hands, you know, as soon as I press this button, you know, Mm -hmm. and um, I actually had a, uh, like a book party with a a few of my friends at the time and I bought them all books 
And we went to Cafe Intermezzo on 10th Street in Midtown. And I just gave them each a book and I signed it. And um, we talked about it. And I just basically like had like a whole like center of attention party on myself. And I like made all my friends go around the table and telling each other how they knew me. <laughs> well deserved though. Well um, deserved. Because I was like, I was literally like, okay. Yeah, I literally, I literally was just like, okay, now the name of the game is, you know, we're all going to get to know each other. And we're going to do that by telling each other how you met me. Now, who's first? You know, and it was just like the best night of my life. And I'm pretty sure all my friends were like, it's a good thing we like you. you got to have a good sets of friends in your life. I, that It just makes all the difference. It makes life so much better. It really does. Mm-hmm. Now, what lessons as you went through the writing, what did you kind of walk away with, gathered during that six-week revival? I'm going to call it six-week-long revival for you of writing this kind of book because of you went through basically like your entire life here and opened up. What kind of lessons did you come away with? That's a really good question. I think I learned... Uh, that some people aren't always going to give you the reaction that you hoped for. And that's okay. You know, and, and you can't always force people to love you just because you've put them up on a pedestal during a project. And that's okay, too. You know, uh, it's, it's it, the older I get, the more I think it's more important to have yourself on a pedestal. Like, you know, keep yourself the center of your life and, and to really take care of yourself. And that was something that I haven't done in my entire life. I've always been a nurturer and I've always just been like, let me please you. Let me do things for you. And so writing the book was like a, a huge slap in the face at some point because it was like, I'm not getting the attention I thought I would get from this. But also it was a huge like, relief of like I finally told my story and it's gonna help somebody anyway so yeah that's what I thought about that that's wonderful oh that's so good to be able to to kind of have that for yourself now we're seven years later after writing this book here and throughout the book you kind of go over your spiritual spiritual journey here how has that evolved over the last seven years Wow. Um, yeah, it's evolved so much. I would say when I wrote the book, I was very much of the like evangelical mind of of just very zealous, very um, like on fire for, you know, being a Christian and, and um, you know, like being prophetic and having visions and things of that nature and just very community minded and I just loved to worship. That was like my whole thing was leading worship and just playing music and really connecting to God just through like drawing and singing and just anything artistic just really gave me a sense of how he felt for me and how I felt for him. And to be honest, over the past seven years, I have really changed. You know, I, I'm still a Christian. I I still go to church, you know, I go to North Point Community Church, Andy Stanley's church, just a slight plug there, but yeah, (laughs) Um, but I've really come to find out that, you know, my relationship with God or anyone's relationship with God is so much bigger and wider than we ever have made it out to be before. Um, And what I mean by that is, is that Andy Stanley said in church a couple months ago that the Bible isn't this infallible without error book that so many people make it out to be. And they elevate it to such a level that it draws people away from their relationship with, with God or with Jesus. And when that becomes a fundamental of the faith of believing the Bible is without error. It's perfect. It's flawless. Whatever's in it is what is a hundred percent true. You know, when you elevate it to that point, you kind of destroy it. And it just like blew my mind and it just fit perfectly with what I felt. And I'm like, yeah, cause we're, we're imperfect people and imperfect people wrote accounts of what they believed, saw an experience during that time period. And it's, 
It's no different than, you know, a bunch of believers now or a bunch of people now writing a textbook about what they saw and experienced over the course of their lifetime. And um, truly come to believe now that, you know, God is, is so much more loving and kind than we like to think he is. Like we like to play the hellfire brimstone and we like to make people believe that if if you're homosexual, you're going to hell. If you're a Muslim, you're going to hell. If you're a witch, you're going to hell. And and just I have just be I have just grown as a person to and if God is so loving and so kind and he's a good father and and he wants only good for us, then he wouldn't just send random people to evil damnation for no reason at all, or just because they're different. And yeah, so that's kind of how I've evolved. Um, I've, I've basically evolved into this kind of a more open concept of Christianity of like, I'm not religious anymore, but I haven't left my faith, you know, and, and I still pray and I still do all the things, but I'm not religious anymore. You know, I love that way you described the Bible there that you said that uh, Reverend Stanley, is that the way, the proper way to say it? Would he, would he call himself a reverend or would he not call himself a reverend? So it's funny you say that. So Andy Stanley, his dad is was Charles Stanley. Charles Stanley just passed away and he would always refer to himself as Dr. Charles Stanley. But I think Andy just likes to be called you know, Andy. <laughs> the way that Andy put it there was perfect. Like, I, I love that, the way the imperfections, the accounts, all the different stuff, the way we kind of use it and everything. That was a very good explanation there. And I connected deeply with that. That's, that was really cool. So thank you. I'm going to put a link as well to the church as well for those that are curious on wanting to look up a little bit more on Andy Stanley, a little bit of more information out there. There'll be a link down at the bottom as well. So kind of give a nice little shout out there. I love that. Now, you said earlier that there may be some writing, that there may not be some writings kind of in the future here. What, 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 what are you thinking in that thought process is of uh, what's next in terms of uh, writing for you? I don't know. You know, I've, I've thought about it and I've attempted to, you know, write again. And I think there's like on my publisher dashboard, there's like a title page that I made for a book that I was going to write and I never wrote it. And I just kind of stare at it and I'm like, Hmm, cause here's the thing, Cade, I don't know that anything could be as divinely inspired or as fruitful as my first book ever has been or ever will be again for me. You know, that was just something that I like my conscience told me to do. Like I felt like God was telling me to do it. I did it. It worked. Like it just flowed seamlessly. I was right in like the quantum field or like the flow of the universe, if you will. And yeah, I don't know that I could replicate that again, to be quite honest. Hey, and there's, that is up to you and your mind and your body of what's kind of there, but it's, I always have to poke and ask the questions of what you thinking. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Are there any things that we covered a lot of stuff that we've talked about throughout this episode? Is there things that we say, hey, you know, I'd really like to to bring this up to talk about for the book of maybe something for us inspirational towards people or, hey, this is just something that I want to have get off my chest that when it comes to writing that I want people to know about. Is there anything you want to discuss that perhaps we didn't, I didn't bring up? Up to Alusia. You're on mute. You're currently on mute. <laughs> Edit that out. Go. I was just like, up, oh, you're talking. <laughs> like, up, oh, you're talking. There's nothing. <laughs> Maybe not edit that part out. I don't know. It could be funny. <laughs> you know, I, you, I'll think about it and see how it flows. I'm not going to lie. I may do that. I may be like, up, oh, you're on mute. <laughs> joys of doing podcasting and recording stuff and meeting things while at doing via Zoom, which is amazing. I mean, just being authentic, you know, I think people like authenticity. So, you know, being like, oh, wait, stop, you're on mute. I think it's going to kind of bring people down to earth of like, oh, like we're all the same. It's, there's no famous or better than it's just we're all humans. We're all screw ups. It, it is true. We've totally had to do this podcast with 
I'll speak and then like delay it by about two seconds, let her speak and then try to make sure that we're not talking over the top of each other. But are you finished? Are you not finished? So, I mean, this has been a really good testament of willpower for the both of us, because I know we both like to talk. (laughs) Yeah. So I think to answer your question, um, (laughs) I I really do kind of want to drive home the fact that, you know, you can absolutely be literally born into against all odds and have an amazing life. And there's nothing stopping you. I mean, it's just, I don't know how deep of detail you want to go into here, but. um, It is your episode. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just like, I don't know, from, from the time I was born to now, it was just, it was not meant biologically, like in the natural order for me to experience the life that I have experienced, you know, like, and I've, I've wrote about this in the book, but for those of you who are like too long, didn't read, I'll talk about it here. So I was born. Um, and if you hear a crunching sound, those are my dogs. They're eating their bones next to me. Sorry. <laughs> ah, that's cool. Um, my cat's scratching the door right now. And I don't know if anybody can hear that or not. <laughs> So um, anyway, I was I was born two months early and the woman who gave birth to me was on drugs and um, I was her third child that she had had and she gave birth to me and got up to go get high or whatever, I guess, and never came back. So with that in mind, my mom, my adopted mom worked with my biological aunt at the local bank. And during the time that I was born, my biological aunt would be like, Hey, like I have a niece who, you know, was just born and has nobody like, do you you know, they kind of worked it out. So that's how my adoptive mom came into my life. And she adopted me when I was probably like nine or 10 months old. I don't really know the details about that, but yeah, she adopted me and then my adoptive parents split up and my adoptive dad got into like drinking and drugs and stuff and they divorced and you know I went through this really hard growing pains of like moving out of my childhood home like having my family split up when I was 7 or 8, you know, and just kind of being shuffled around cuz my aunt and uncle were a huge part of my life. That was my dad's brother and his wife. They were a huge part. They couldn't biologically have children. And so I was like the child they never had. And so when my parents were splitting up, they took me on vacation in their van to Tennessee. And then I came back to Georgia to a completely different place to be, to live. Like I left one house oh, wow. and then came back to a different place. And so I grew up with my mom um, for the first few years after they divorced. Um, my mom, my brother, and I grew up in a two-bedroom, one-bathroom trailer. It was probably like 500 or 700 square feet. It was really tiny. And uh, my mom met my stepdad, and they got married, and they built a house uh, up on the hill, we call it, because it's like literally down the street and on a hill. And with my mom's side of the family. So it's like all family land there. Living there, just, just, you know, kind of, I remember watching the house go up and being amazed of like watching the process of a house being built. I was like 12, I think at the time. And I just remember, you know, seeing my own room because I didn't have my own room. My mom and I shared a bedroom when my parents split up. So I went from growing up as a small kid to having my own room, my own Barbies, my own TV, my own things, to having my parents split up, sharing my room, my TV, and my Barbies with my mom, you know, and then having, again, my own room. And so I just remember, like, sitting in that room as it was being built, just sitting there for hours at a time, just marveling that this was my room and this was my place. And I remember the first time I used the bathroom, it was my own bathroom in the hallway. And I flushed the toilet and I'm running around the house yelling, like, it works. It really works. It's mine, you know. (laughs) And, you know, it's just like tribulation after tribulation and, like, 
miracle after freak accident, you could say just, um, you know, I, every, every odd was against me of ever being successful in being someone that people can look up to. And I don't know. It just happened anyway. I was determined to survive. I was determined to grow up to be a good person. I was determined to, you know, get myself out of the hellhole I experienced, you know, uh, in some ways and was very blessed in others. And so, yeah, I mean, that's just kind of my overall takeaway is, is like your situations don't matter. Like when you start taking the 3D world way too seriously and start counting on that as your only hope, that's when you start to sink. And that's when you, you know, kind of get into a rut of depression and that's where suicide comes from and, you know, all those type of things. And so the trick is, is to always keep your mind in the visualization era of, okay, you know, this is where I'm going. This is what I'm going to accomplish and keep moving forward and re just realizing that nobody's going to do it for you. You know, it's your life. You have to pick it up and move it along yourself because nobody else will. And gosh, it's hard, but like the end results are so worth it. And uh, suicide's never the answer. That's amazing. Phenomenal. And oh, I'm borderline crying here <laughs> just because the reminders uh, of it and the vulnerability for doing that is such a, it's a strong thing to do. And I'm envious of those that can be able to pull that out and get there. And it's taken me years myself to kind of start doing these things and putting it out there. And I went through my instances with my struggling with my PTSD, my anxiety, my depression. And if I could look back at myself when I first went through it, when I was in my very early twenties and now being in almost my mid thirties being like, Hey, be vulnerable, like go through this process a little earlier and face it more head on. And it makes things so much easier now that I I've kind of gone through it and done it. I'm like, man, imagine where I could have been if I did it earlier, but I go, no, 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 I should, I didn't need to do it earlier. I needed to do it now. It happened when it happened and yeah. I went through it. And so I, I give anyone mad props for going through and facing head on and not letting it define who you are, letting it become your kind of that, that next step for you. Cause you learn a lot about yourself when you go through these things and that's a, a super powerful thing. And that's one thing that I say when you, when, for those that pick up and read this book, I, I recommend it to anybody. It doesn't matter your age, whether you are five years old or you are a hundred years old. I think it's really going to establish a lot of great healing and great opportunity for you to be able to go through. If you sit down to this book and miracles, freak accidents is the name of it. Look it up as Kristen M King, C H R S T E N M the letter M period king k-i-n-g 100 percent. look it up spend some time with it is there any shout outs kristen that you would like to do here kind of here at the end like say hey to an earlier you, you shout out to your mom earlier we did a shout out to uh mr andy is there anybody else or any organizations or anything you want to throw out there going this is something that i think everyone should know about it's just so hard to narrow it down because like yeah, there's so many people that have been influential in my life. And, um, you know, notably, I think of one of my professors that, you know, I kept in touch with for years after I graduated. And um, he's now in Utah at a college teaching and he's roughly our age and just kind of very brilliant minded. And so just shout out to him. Hi, Dr. Pascarella. Hope you're doing well. And just, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Everyone that's listening, hello. <laughs> it's super awkward. I love it. I love it. <laughs> hey, man, I, I get to talk about myself in third person saying, my name is Kate Curtis. I'm like, you know, so there's there's so much awkwardness with anything in life. But you know what? Awkwardness passes. It goes on. <laughs> that's true. It does. Our teachers, our professors, uh, people that kind of come in and out of our lives whenever you have the opportunity to go back and say thank you or going back and reaching out to somebody that way, 
for them, it really kind of lets them have a connection back to their story as well. Like when you reached out to your professors and asking for their help, that was, I bet for them, I'm not saying it, you know, stroking their ego or anything, but it, it really kind of made them feel purposeful. So I recommend for anybody that even if it's a small thing or something big, if say thank you to somebody, go back and honor that, you know, kindness and gift that they give to you because they impacted you and they impacted other people as well. And it kind of lets us feel like, you know, maybe we've done something that we never may have thought of before. So that's kind of like my little fun little takeaway of, to kind of throw out there to the episode that I think you said very elegantly. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, and honestly, that is so true. Like my favorite thing in the world to do is to like honor other people. Uh, I love like encouraging people and telling people just how much they've meant to my life and how much they mean to other people. And I love to see their face light up and I love to see the joy it brings. And, you know, if, if I'm writing it via email, uh, I, I can imagine them being happy about it and, and it brings like a whole like sense of purpose to my life, you know? And uh, so I guess, you know, I'll just kind of throw it in there and say, I'm really grateful for you on honestly, just cause you know, you're such a good friend and I love the way that you're consistent. And I love the way, like every time I have a birthday, you write on my wall, happy birthday, peace be with you for like the last 12 years. <laughs> it's awesome. You know, I I feel bad now that you say it here and you're like, hey, I, you know, the last 12 years, I fell off the boat in March of not going through and posting for a lot of people. And I've actually, people have messaged me saying, where's my happy birthday? <laughs> and I haven't got back on the boat, but it's funny how that, yeah, those little moments that you don't, I, I don't, I didn't think about it for a long time until someone started bringing that up and you're right. I've, I've been doing it for a while and people look forward to it. And I didn't think about it that way for until this, I stopped doing it. And someone started saying, <laughs> got on to me. <laughs> so th thank you for, for giving me that. Absolutely. You just never know like what you mean to somebody. And a lot of times we'll never know what we mean to anybody. Cause we never say, we never speak up and we never say anything. And I am like the biggest, like anxiety inducing, per like I, I get a lot of anxiety from speaking my feelings a lot of times to people and getting really vulnerable. And I know that like, especially if I am in like a romantic type of mindset towards somebody and I tell them how I feel, it like terrifies me because more often than not, it's always like just in my head and it's some kind of situation that I've created within myself and they don't feel that same way but at the end of the day it's like who cares you know because you never know what you're going to mean to somebody until you tell them like what you mean to them or what they mean to you and uh yeah I mean that's just so important I wish we did more of that of hey I appreciate you or hey I like this about you or you know even just I love telling my my coworkers, man just like hey you're doing a great job or hey you always seem to blah 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 you know, like whatever it is. And, um, cause when we're not here anymore, like what do we have left, but what we left behind and other people are going to be proof of what we leave behind. And, and I really want to make the biggest impact I can in that area of life. That's perfect. Oh, I can't think of a better way to end out this podcast with that lovely bit of conversation. So I'm going to go with Kristen. Thank you for coming on here and sharing your story, sharing about your book, sharing this lovely bits of knowledge that you got to do with the Learning from Friends universe. So thank you. Like I, I can't say it enough. It's my pleasure. So before we all leave here, if anyone would like to reach out and would like to connect with Kristen, send me an email, which is Cade, C-A-D-E, at learningfromfriends.com. I'll connect you two together because of you never know who's going to kind of try to reach through. And I want to be a nice little filter barrier because of you never know. People out there can be very interesting. So I'll be kind of a filter if you would like to reach out, ask some connections or connect in. I'll connect you all together. And 
if you would like to reach out, not through email, I have a Facebook page. You can be able to look up uh, Learning From Friends podcast. You can find it that way. I have a Twitter page. I rarely really post on Twitter um, just because it's not really my thing. But, you know, another way of social media. And the I have a Patreon page, which you can be able to, if you want to make a donation, however much you're feeling comfortable donating, feel free. I uh, it goes a long way. I do this again, just for fun, for free, for me, for everything else. It's a fun little art project, but you know, I'll take a dollar, five dollars, hundred dollars, ten million dollars. No, no, you know, whatever kind of fills your fancy there. So that is the way to be able to reach out. If you want to help me grow this audience, share this with a friend. I love word of mouth is the best advertising that you can be able to give for anything. So if you don't mind sharing it with a friend, sharing it with a family member, pass it along to a coworker, that'd be awesome. Just any little bits there that go on. So as you all leave, you all know that it's coming to an end when I say, my name is Kay Curtis, your tour guide in this lovely adventure that I like to call learning from friends. And most of all, don't forget, let your curiosity fly high.